Welcome to the EW Podcast. I'm your host, Eric White. In today's episode, I speak with Vanessa Dillon. Vanessa is a documentary producer and writer, and here we discuss her documentary, The Divided Brain, released in 2018. This documentary is based on the Ian McGilchrist book titled The Master and His Emissary, The Divided Brain and the Making of the Western World. In his book, Ian McGilchrist uses psychology, neuroscience, and reflections on society and culture to make the case that the Western world has become overly reliant on the left hemisphere of the brain. Why does that matter? Well, in short, the left hemisphere is considered the more analytical and detail-oriented side of our brains. It helps us narrow our focus. The right hemisphere is responsible for allowing us to view the bigger picture. McGilchrist argues that because Western societies have placed so much emphasis on the left hemisphere to construct our world, we now face crises such as climate change, extreme political divisiveness, and economic inequality. Now, I haven't read the book yet, but in the show notes for this episode, I'll be sure to share some resources that Vanessa shared with me um, to help me understand the ideas I was about to watch in the documentary. Um, I will also provide a link to the documentary on Vimeo and to the original book uh, written by Ian McGilchrist. So to get us started, um, before my interview with Vanessa Dillon, um, let's take a quick listen to the trailer for The Divided Brain. How do we experience the world? How do we make sense of it, measure it, construct it, and understand our position in it? A controversial scientist, Ian McGilchrist, has developed a radical theory about how our brain interprets the world. Ian McGilchrist, he's a psychiatrist and author of The Master and His Emissary, The Divided Brain and the Making of the Western World. Two hemispheres have styles, takes, if you like, on the world. They see things differently, they prioritize different things, they have different values. McGilchrist claims that the left hemisphere of the brain is gradually colonizing our experience of the world with potentially disastrous implications. A way of thinking which is reductive, mechanistic, has taken us over. We behave like people who had right hemisphere damage. It's made us enormously powerful. It's enabled us to become wealthy. But it's also meant that we've lost the means to understand the world. His revolutionary theory has attracted prominent supporters worldwide, comparing him to Freud and Darwin. I think The Master of the Hemisphere was possibly one of the most important books I've read. The idea that there is a distinction between those two perspectives seems to me correct. and I see it all the time in my own field of clinical psychology. I kind of had one revelation after another. I mean, it just explained an incredible number of things that I've always been slightly puzzled about. But some scientists think he's a heretic. It's a fantastic book. It's a fantastic book that I don't believe in. The brain is as mechanical as clockwork. A famous English physicist said that. Let's just get over that. Now McGilchrist is on the road invited to speak about his view of the brain and society. Could the problems of the modern world be influenced by an imbalance in the human brain? And what does that imply about our future? For Ian McGilchrist, the problem is not only bad politics or a warped economic system. The problem is inside our modern brain. And now, my conversation with Vanessa Dillon, producer and writer for The Divided Brain. All right, I'm here with Vanessa Dillon. She is the producer and a writer for the documentary The Divided Brain. Thank you for joining me this morning, Vanessa. You're welcome, Eric. It's a pleasure to uh, be here. 
Um, so let's just start off with a quick description of the divided brain. I will, um, before this, have played uh, the trailer in the podcast for the listeners to hear. But um, in your own words, can you describe the main point of the documentary? Yes. Well, the the film, The Divided Brain, is based on the book by Dr. Ian Gilchrist called The Master and His Emissary, The Divided Brain and the Making of the Western World. Now, that's a bit of a mouthful, but the essence of the thesis is, is there a growing imbalance in our modern brain? So McGilchrist's work and the film uh, look at the evolution of Western culture and society through the relationship between the left and right hemisphere of the brain. It sounds like a complex thesis, but I hope the film does simplify it. Uh, so McGilchrist, through his 20-year research, um, research that was based on thousands of pieces of scientific evidence, believes that the left hemisphere of the brain over centuries has been gaining power over the right hemisphere. Now, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. So if we look at the difference between the two hemispheres, the left and the right hemisphere of the brain, uh, uh, unlike the old pop psychology where the right was creative and the left was technical, that's all wrong. We know today that they both do everything, but it's not what they do that's important. It's how they view the world and how they interact with it. So McGilchrist, like many other neuroscientists, has observed stroke victims and their brain scans. And we do know that the left hemisphere gives a narrow, very sharply focused attention to detail without understanding the larger context. So it sees the trees, but not the forest. It can't understand the big picture. The left hemisphere is very useful. It gives us tools and technology. It's also the virtual world. So it deals with things, not people, and it deals with abstract ideas. It loves bureaucracy. This is the brain of rules, systems, check boxes. The banks love the left hemisphere. <laughs> but it can't make human connections. It doesn't understand relationships. It doesn't understand humor, tone of voice. It doesn't understand metaphor or implicit meaning such as poetry. So things and people are not individuals and they're not unique, but they're groups that can be organized and sorted and filed into a system of rules. The left hemisphere doesn't read body language. It can speak, but the left hemisphere has no judgment. It has no gut instinct. And people with a preponderance of left hemisphere uh, leanings can be taken advantage of. They can't tell friend from foe. So uh, by contrast, then, the, the right hemisphere is the master of the brain. This is the executive brain. The right hemisphere sees the panoramic view of the world. It sees the, the broad view. And more importantly, it perceives an interconnected world. The right hemisphere can't speak. It's silent. But it understands relationships. It understands body language expression in the face, an implicit meaning, hmm. like p poetry, songs. It gets, understanding humor, for exactly, example. Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. So it, it gets jokes. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it understands our relationship with nature and living things. It embraces life. And it understands subtlety, such as irony. So this is the, the place of judgment and intuition, wisdom. It's the holistic brain. It's really the embodied experience, our embodied experience with other people and with nature. Now, it's important to have a balance of uh, both. I guess I'll just illustrate with another further point um, that was uh, that I took away from some of this work, and that was of. Uh, say, having a bird in the wild who is trying to eat, they're using their left brain to focus on the worm, for example, that they're eating, and the right brain is being used to perceive the environment around them. 
and uh, be aware of danger, for example, or an approaching predator. So you have, I'm just trying to make sure that I am getting this correctly. The left brain is narrowly focused on what is being done currently. And the right brain in animals and humans probably is used to put the pieces together to understand the larger focus. That is exactly it. So the reason we have that corpus callosum that separates the left and right hemisphere is because we need both hemispheres in order to survive. So we need to be able to to search for food, but, but at the same time, protect ourselves. All animals have it, including human beings. Mm-hmm. It, Um, If I were to take a very simple sports analogy, and I don't know if the neuroscientist, Ian, would agree with me, but (laughs) this is just a very simple example. Mm -hmm. A good soccer player relies on the left hemisphere for his skill in manipulating the ball. It's all of those hours of practice, practice, practice. Mm -hmm. That is the left hemisphere. But a great soccer player takes into account the entire field. He Mm. anticipates with the right hemisphere what's going to happen. It's that acute instinct. Mm -hmm. I like that analogy. And um, I think that also makes a point that I think is important is that the documentary is certainly about um, how humans have over relied on the left hemisphere, but it doesn't seem like the answer that you would intuit from that, you know, the answer is not to switch the reliance to full right brain. The answer is to achieve a better balance of the two, recognizing that they're both important for a healthy survival. Exactly, exactly. And that reminds me of one of Einstein's sayings. He said, logic will take you from A to B. Now that's left hemisphere. Imagination will take you everywhere. Hmm. That is right hemisphere. If you have a combination of both, you're you're doing well. Mm-hmm. Um, so, what was kind of your biggest takeaway, uh, perhaps about yourself from working on the film? Was there something that you, and maybe an aha moment of realization in your own life that you uh, came upon while working on this? Yes, I mean. Um, on a larger level and on a smaller level also. So what really resonated with me about Ian's work was uh, how in Western society, the spiritual and the metaphorical are given really short shrift. Mm -hmm. And technology is seen as the answer to all of our problems. And it's really hard not to be influenced by the scientific mindset that really wants to rely on data for everything. It, we're in a world where technology is bringing about so much change, and so it's tempting to value. It's very tempting um, for us to value the technological world more highly than anything else and reduce the importance of human values. Now, we all realize that technology has enhanced human existence greatly, but who's going to decide the ethical basis upon which that technology is going to be used? Hmm. How are we going to make those decisions? Mm. Uh, That's the wisdom and deep thinking of the right hemisphere that helps us deal with complex problems. So for students in any technological field, what I came away with is we need a balance between the study of the humanities, a serious study of the humanities, along with the the technological fields Mm -hmm. on a much smaller level. I realized that I had absolutely no relationship to nature or to wildlife. Hmm. I'm I'm the kind of person that would never go camping. Just the idea of insects, (laughs) bugs. And, you know, I had, I realized that I had really been missing this kind of embodied experience with the, with the uh, natural world, which could actually benefit me. And, uh, you know, I came to the realization that, I'd been living in my brain for many, many years, and that wasn't healthy for me. I, I now take more walks in the woods and forests, and I've been even observing animals more, even feeding squirrels. I mean, mm-hmm. I'm the kind of person I used to make fun of tree huggers, and I think I'm on my way to becoming a tree hugger. <laughs> it's, just, it's just awful. It's awful. <laughs> yeah, that's... I- 
<laughs> I, I think about that a lot, actually, about how um, in current society there seems to be, you know, that the death of religion has kind of been a slow ongoing process for the last couple hundred years. And it doesn't seem as though much in terms of the sacred has replaced it. Like you say, we have become um, worshipers of technology in many ways while leaving kind of this other bigger picture connectedness behind. And so I think, yeah, that was also something for me that was interesting to kind of think of in the context of left and right hemispheres, which I think the, the film does a great job of uh, exploring. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, so how, how did you become involved with this documentary? Um, I um, had been reading about Ian's book. Uh, I'd been reading some re reviews about it. And um, as you know, I'd already made several films about the brain for the for CBC and for mm -hmm. National Geographic. Well, one was a very popular one called The Musical Brain, featuring Sting as our main science guinea pig. And uh, also the, the film Fixing My Brain, which was based on one of your guests, actually, mm -hmm. Barbara Young. So I was already in this space. And... So I picked up the book and I was just flabbergasted. It was a beast of a read. It was just brutal. <laughs> I had to look, I had to reread and reread paragraphs. But I realized that uh, this was an extraordinary book. It was a, a book written by a great intellect, but also someone uh, with the unusual background of being a psychiatrist, a neuroscientist, and an English professor at Oxford. Mm. So Ian McGilchrist's uh, breadth of knowledge that was highly unusual, ha, you know, gave him, let's say, the chops to be able to deal with this extraordinary subject. Hmm. So I, I just knew. I knew I had to make a film about the ideas in his book, and it became a mission. It was a process that had more curses than Tut's tomb, I can't tell you. <laughs> I knew that this film that was going to deal with the two hemispheres and how they were linked to the evolution of our Western culture and our modern, modern society, I knew that this film was going to be the biggest hurdle I would ever face. I do not wish to repeat this experience. <laughs> is that because of the detractors from his theory? Is that is it because why was it so diff difficult to it pull was, this together? It was difficult on many levels. No, his uh, detractors were just wonderful. The people okay. who came on to our film, who came on our film, and were very articulate about their views. Uh, uh, yeah, that was one thing that I really enjoyed from the film was that uh, Dr. Ian McGilchrist actually sits down with someone who shares his skepticism directly with him. And you kind of get all sides of the picture and you're left at the end having to decide for yourself, which I think is uh, at this point useful. I'm glad that you got that perception of the film. I was trying to be very even handed and, and as mm -hmm. a filmmaker... Uh, especially if you want a broadcaster to come on board, you've got to make sure that you're not, that you don't have a bias, that you're not in favor of this theory. My objective was this is a fascinating mind. This is one of the great minds of our time. And this is his thesis. Let's explore it. Let's take it apart. Let's see what he says about it. But let's go and deal with a lot of these other people and these scientists who don't agree with him. What is their uh, perspective? So, um, so the difficulties in making the film were simply practical ones. You know, just losing financing in the middle of production, having to scramble, going through a number of uh, creative teams. Just the, the creative side of it was just beastly because we had to create an engaging film visually mm. that deals with a very heady topic. So it was a question of how do we do this? How do we link the evolution of Western society to the evolution of our brain without appearing to be lunatics? Mm -hmm. Well, I think you did a great job. So good work. Thank you. <laughs> so what is uh, the main 
thing you hope viewers learn by watching this film. And, and I'll just note that in the show notes for this episode, I will provide links to the film. Um, there are some links to resources you provided me, which I will also provide um, in the show notes. And I guess I would, if someone is eager to watch the film, I would actually probably recommend what you recommended me, and that's to maybe watch the animation that is on RSA or read the Jonathan Rosen interview uh, with Dr. Ian McGilchrist because they did both help frame the vi- the, the documentary for me. Um, but yeah, what is what is the main takeaway you hope viewers get by, by watching your documentary? I think if by watching the documentary, if people can learn to be more aware of their environments and to question whether those environments are healthy for them. Uh, For example, if if people note that if you live in a high rise and work in a high rise and eat at your desk and don't engage much with the natural world, you're likely on your way to experiencing some kind of mental uh, problems. Um, if you're not engaging with people in an embodied way, and I, and I don't mean sex here, I mean, you know, volunteer work, social relationships, your mental health is going to suffer. And I think um, one thing also I think that people may learn from the film, and I hope that they take away from this, is something that we can guard against and something that's been creeping up on us for decades is the encroaching bureaucracy in our society in all fields. Um, All our public services, from medical workers to teachers to police forces, have been sounding the alarm about not being able to do the real or embodied work with people properly because of the increasing bureaucracy and red tape. Mm. So this is a litigation problem. So we're lawyering up everywhere, and this fear of litigation is widespread and it's preventing us from solving problems in a rather direct and honest way Mm -hmm. and i think uh, a lot of people will be aware that uh, our rules and regulations in our modern life have have dispensed with common sense we've all had the experience of being caught up in some bureaucratic nightmare of some sort because you know we're caught up in a in a vortex because you've checked off the wrong box And I think it's making us afraid to communicate honestly with people. So I think people should check in with their feelings and pay more attention to their gut instincts. If you sense danger, pay attention. Don't rationalize it. Hmm. I like that. So it's it's about getting back to the intuitions and uh, the human to human connection that we seem to be abandoning. And I think that's a really interesting message, especially right now with uh, so many people experiencing the lockdown um, and also just the movement of daily interactions to the online world um, forced by the lockdown. I think that this idea is more important than ever. And so I just really appreciate you taking the time to help me share about your, your, your uh, documentary. Thank you, Eric. It's been a pleasure. One of the things that really motivated me to make the film, if I can just make one last comment, is that I believe in the value of Ian's work, and I believe that it crosses disciplines. And it's really needed in in a very polarized world right now, in a very politically polarized world. And my objective was to make a film that would engage people intellectually, that would engage their minds, but also their emotions. Mm. Uh, I was hoping that the film would engage people viscerally. And I wanted to give people that stroke of insight into how they live in our modern society. And hopefully the film will inspire people to, to, to observe their environments more closely and perhaps to take some actions to improve their lives. All right. Well, if you're interested in watching the documentary, The Divided Brain, you can find a link to it online in the show notes for this episode. If you enjoyed this episode, I would highly encourage you to share it with a friend or family member who might also find it interesting. And please don't forget to follow the EW podcast on Spotify, iTunes, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you're feeling really generous, leave a review. This will help the podcast reach more people. 
So thank you very much for listening and we'll see you next time.